Okay, anyway, let us start. We are not going to wait any longer. So we have uh, quite a number of people over here, seven people, and I uh, am not sure only about phylogenomics. Uh, I would ask this person to just to give me name. Uh, what is your name, please? I am sorry, I'm David. Huh? Wow, it's, uh, sound is not good. Can you say your last name? Ferreiro Garcia, David. Ah, David Ferreiro Garcia. Justo, yes. And you are from Spain? Yes, from Spain. Oh, it should be uh, almost nine o'clock in the evening in Spain, right? Yes. <laughs> Okay, good. And uh, we have Anahi Martinez and um, you are from Mexico, right? We have Ad Alger Medico. Hi. And, yes, and where are you from? I'm from Peru. From Peru, okay, great. And uh, we have Anna Hernandez Ledesma. Also, where are you from, Anna? Anita? I'm from Mexico, too. Mexico? Yes. Sounds good. Maria Moya. Um, and uh, Maria, where are you from? I'm from Peru. Peru. All right. Florencia Mascali. Um, Hi, I'm from Argentina. Argentina. Yes. Welcome. Buenos Aires or some other place? Another place from Rosario, where is Messi. <laughs> from... Sounds good. <laughs> and Pedro Romero from Peru, right? If Pedro is present, he should be maybe. Okay. Just a second. Pedro, are you here? Probably Mike is not working, maybe. You can chat, you can put something in chat. Anyway, so we are in this group of people who will listen to our presentation about gene finding. And just to say that you can um, um, uh, our task was uh, relatively difficult because we didn't know how much uh, compu computer programming, com um, computational science, computer science background our students would have. And um, that was a challenge. So part of our um, tutorial will be theoretical and part will be practical. And what I will do now, I will um, share screen with uh, presentation. And um, let me say that multiple participants can share screen and I will uh, do it right now. One second. Okay. 
So this is the screen which I want to show. Do you see my screen? Yes, I do. Yeah. All right. Um, Alex, there, if there are students who want to get to the room, you can admit them, right? I can admit them too. So anyone just make sure you we are not losing people, right? Yes, yes I will yes. take care of them. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, so we have a group of people who worked on this tutorial. Uh, this uh, is presented uh, the work of um, uh, bioinformatics lab at the Georgia Tech. Uh, so I am a head of the lab at uh, biomedical engineering and computational science. My name is Mark Borodovsky. Um, Alexandra Lomsadze is senior research scientist in this lab working on gene prediction for more than 20 years. Tomasz Bruna is a PhD student who is working also on this topic more than three years already. So we um, have uh, quite a number of um, material to share. So this is the agenda of this um, pretty long time, almost four hours after we lost a little bit in the beginning. And uh, as you see, we are going to talk about theoretical part, introduction into gene prediction algorithms. Um, I will do this. Then um, we divide gene prediction into prokaryotes and eukaryotes and metagenomes, and there will be several sections, as you see, a practical guide for gene prediction in prokaryotes and metagenomes. It's Alex Lomsadze. And then Tomas will take care about uh, three parts. He is very ambitious, so he wanted to uh, talk uh, about these three sections, sections on gene predictions in eukaryotes with practical guide for one group of um, uh, gene prediction programs, uh, it's uh, gene mark uh, programs as a whole series of programs here are different types of gene mark programs. And then we also have a combination with another gene finder, uh, it's Augustus, and this is our uh, <clears throat> collaborative product with Germany and the name of this uh, system uh, pipeline is Breaker. So we have <clears throat> this uh, division into time sections and there will be some short breaks in between. So that's the way uh, <clears throat> we plan this uh, tutorial. So in the beginning, I will um, start with some mathematical uh, <clears throat> important concepts that uh, these algorithms are using because our input are nucleotide sequences. Nucleotide sequences are um, <clears throat> just texts uh, with letters and these letters are written by nature and this sequence of letters kind of genomic uh, or genetic language that has to be deciphered and we want to identify in the sequences where are those fragments which code for proteins, distinguish them from fragments which don't code for proteins. And our initial guess is that these uh, fragments uh, should have some compositional differences. And these differences may not be just simple A, T, C, G differences in uh, frequencies of letters, but it may be more complex differences, uh, differences in frequencies of um, dinucleotides, triplets, etc. Or maybe uh, these differences won't go 
um, uniformly along the Both grammar and spelling are important, but if you hello, um, then um, these frequencies may be position dependent. So this is important part that uh, the frequencies which we uh, as statisticians, as mathematicians, think that they would reflect this genetic language, like frequencies of letters are specific for English letters and any other um, languages. So we look into some biases in uh, those frequencies to identify uh, protein coding regions. So let me say what is the mathematical concept, a mathematical construct which works with frequencies. First of all, this is Markov chains. So Markov chains, uh, they may discriminate between uh, maybe sequences in one and the same composition, but there will be a different uh, dinucleotide uh, frequencies. Uh, and Markov chain models, they have states, ACGT are nucleotide states, and then when we go from one nucleotide to another, we make transitions in the sequence, and these transitions may uh, be described by probabilities. It will be frequencies of how frequently we come from A to CGTA in the next position. So from C to other three plus C um, nucleotides in the next position. So this dinucleotide frequencies, if we count them in a sample sequence, then give, they give us parameters, transition probabilities uh, of um, Markov chain that are computed in a rather simple way. It is uh, count of dinucleotides divided by counts of how frequently we see the first letter. Um, and these um, estimates are pretty accurate. It's actually maximum likelihood estimates of a parameter, which in case of the first order Markov chain, which uh, has history a memory of one nucleotide in the past, moving to another nucleotide in the future. So we have 16 parameters. They would be defined by measuring frequencies of 16 dinucleotides. And uh, we have matrix of 16 transition probabilities, which will define probability of transition from one nucleotide to another. This is a simple Markov chain. There is no any positional dependence everything is counted. If we have a sequence, we count all the nucleotides, A, T, C, G, all the dinucleotides, uh, two letter frequencies, or K means K equal two. And uh, this is the whole one uniform model that will be described by these 16 transition probabilities. So these transition probabilities are important in which sense that we can use uh, this model to uh, compute the probability of a sequence. Uh, probability of a sequence, uh, in my case, it's sequence x1 to xn, uh, can be uh, defined. In the bottom, you see it is uh, initial probability for first letter. We don't have any history. We have to use as the frequency of uh, that particular type of nucleotide multiplied by all this transition probability from X1 to X2, from X2 to X3, et cetera, all the way probability of Xn given Xn minus one. So all this, uh, this is a fundamental formula of theory of Markov chain. So we have ability having a model with 16, um, parameters compute probability of having particular a sequence uh, generated by this model. 
So that's a very important uh, formula and it's uh, working, you will see in the gene prediction algorithm. So how to uh, make prediction of protein coding regions in genomic sequences? Now I go to what I mentioned about uh, the position of frequencies. Indeed, we cannot accomplish much with uh, just uniform uh, models. We need to look into some interesting um, patterns which exist in protein coding regions and distinguish them from non-coding regions. So this uh, slide shows um, multiple alignment of more than 1,000 E. coli sequences, which each of which has a start of a gene in the middle of a sequence, and every gene goes into uh, from left to right. So this is five prime to three prime direction. Uh, I cannot uh, show letters, it will be uh, just in unreadable. <clears throat> what I show here is in each position, and positions are shown like 4, 8, 12, 16, etc. So these positions uh, go uh, in the um, 60 nucleotides in the gene region, and before that, we have 60 nucleotides in non coding region. So, what is important to observe from this alignment that um, there is a periodicity in frequencies of nucleotides. Uh, nucleotide A, you see, has all this uh, like zigzag. Uh, pattern and actually this is a periodicity of three. Same thing is for T and C and um, G on top. So protein coding region have really different type of ordering of nucleotides than non-coding regions in which you see this kind of noise in fluctuations in nucleotide frequencies. So what uh, is behind this uh, three periodic pattern? And first of all, is codon usage. So it's a triplet structure of genetic code. Uh, and this would be great to use, but we need to use it in the most effective way. So how to use this uh, positional patterns? Uh, we are going to, uh, I will skip this slide and uh, tell you that I can use this positional uh, patterns to, I, to define a chain model, but this Markov chain model will be non-uniform. It will be three periodic. Instead of one matrix with 16 parameters, it will have three matrices, 16 parameters each. And similarly, the uh, parameters will be estimated by calculation of these ratios, and frequencies of dinucleotides divided by frequencies of nucleotide in the first position of dinucleotide and these formulas will be also will have index k which stands for the frame of reading so it will be either first second position of codon second third position of codon or third and first position of codon so i group together dinucleotides sitting in one and the same position with respect to the start of a codon. So if I do this and compute this transition probabilities, then I have uh, three matrices. You see three matrices, uh, 16 elements each. They define transition from one nucleotide to another nucleotide. But 
it defines them accurately when they sit in one or another position of a codon. Now, what I have to remember also that in, in addition to genes in the protein coding regions, there are non-coding regions and some other type of regions. I start to think about composition very seriously. This, which are complementary to genes on complementary strand. So they may have some other pattern, which is not same composition pattern as in gene on direct strand. So that's why if I want to use only one strand to predict genes in genomic sequence, I have to model patterns which exist in genes, in gene shadows, in non-coding regions, be very accurate about this. Now, let us see how this all logic is implemented in the very first gene mark um, gene prediction algorithm that was uh, developed at Georgia Tech in the beginning of uh, 1990s and published in 1993. So this is a pretty complex formula if you don't um, have experience with uh, applied mathematics, you may be lost for a moment, but the meaning of this is very simple. We have the um, same formulas as for Markov chain. Remember, I have shown this fundamental formula. We just compute probability of a fragment. Uh, and now I have to accurately use what I have in my three matrices. For instance, if I have a fragment, S is a fragment of a sequence, then um, I <clears throat> can say, and I will stop sharing for a moment, and I will ask you if you see my whiteboard, and what I have on the whiteboard. Do you see what I am writing here? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so I will move it a little bit away. And I have these nucleotides, one, two, three, etc. right? So this will be positions of nucleotides in one codon, another codon, and I have my formula, which you don't see now, but probability of SN code one means that I start from the first nucleotide and I will take probability of this one, which I designate as X1, probability of X2, X1. And here, because I start in this position, I will say this is first frame, but second to third, I will use my second method, X3, X2, and three to one, I will use my third method. So I do this all the way to the end of the fragment. So this is my fragment SN. And now when I want to compute uh, another option for this fragment, I have to start from second nucleotide. I have to start from second nucleotide and compute the probability. No, I'm sorry. I didn't say it right. I have to think being not um, the first nucleotide in the codon. Another scenario that I have to consider is that the nucleotide X1 is in second position. Two, one, three, uh, one, two, I'm sorry. 
let me write it right. Two, three, one. Two, three, one, right? So this will be another arrangement of nucleotides. And then I will start with P2, X1, etc. all this with P2, X3, Ah. This is the same. The nucleotides stand the same. What is changing is changing the matrices and the parameters that I will use to compute the probability. Same thing. Code three. I have to use another assumption that this is three, one, Two, three, one, two, three, right? So this is the X1, etc. Okay. So we have uh, this uh, products which have different values, not surprisingly, the results of this uh, multiplications will be different. So they will give different uh, probabilities for our fragment being in first frame, in second frame, in third frame, as well as we can use model for gene shadow and it will be also phased with different frames and this will give us uh, the another three different numbers. And in addition, we can use a model for non-coding region, which would, would, will not have any uh, non-uniform properties. For non-coding regions, we are going to use uh, the standard Markov model. And then when we have that, we, again, I will return to the, um, same presentation and I will show the slide that shows the whole algorithm. This is the direct strand. Um, scenarios how my fragment can be interpreted. Uh, gene shadow uh, means that the gene is actually a complementary strand, but I can compute probabilities for my fragment for this scenario as well. And if this fragment is non-coding, I will use Markov chain model to compute probability of the fragment. And what I really need, I need not probability of a sequence given model, but probability of a model given sequence. And this is accomplished by using Bayesian formula with all my products, uh, which I computed already ready to for this Bayesian kind of transformation to probability of the scenario, the model given sequence. So with for a sequence fragment, in this way I can compute posterior probability that this is protein coding and this is actually the um, very important part of gene prediction algorithm, as you understand. So we have such a posterior probabilities, which we are going to show in graph, in gra graphical way. So this will be like this. So we have three panels for direct strand, three panels for complementary strand, we don't need non-coding regions because our posterior probabilities sum up to one. So if we have um, those graphs in a third frame, which show probability close to one, that there is a protein coding region, then um, it's impossible that non-coding probability will be anything but zero. So we have um, in this fragment of E. coli sequence, um, 2000 nucleotide long fragment, 
and we predicting four genes in this fragment, three on direct and one on complementary strand. Um, what we show in the middle of the panels, uh, these are pro open reading frames, which start from one of the three possible starts and end by one of the three possible stops. And you see that some uh, open reading frames have no probability to be a gene, although some even shorter open reading frames can have pretty good probability, which identify them as a gene. Uh, any question at the moment from participants? Yeah. Hi. Yes. Hello. Uh, how do you know if the if we are referring to the forward strand or the reverse strand? Uh, forward and reverse strands are kind of uh, conventions. Whatever we have as a record in gene bank, we consider it as a direct strand, and opposite will be reverse strand. Whatever you get out of the sequencing machine, you have it as a direct strand and opposite will be uh, reverse. This situation is symmetrical. It's your choice what you choose as a direct uh, complementary. I can run a gene mark on complementary strand and I will get the same picture. Ah, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other question? Okay, if no question, I will give more details on this picture. So this picture is obtained um, by um, actually using so-called sliding windows as I take a window, it says here 96 nucleotide long. And um, it says also that I move this window with step 12. And I also, made more complex um, non-uniform Markov chain model, not just from one nucleotide to another, but from five nucleotides to next, or from four nucleotides to next, it will be fourth or fifth order Markov chain. So in this case, I used frequencies of pentamers to uh, phased frequencies. So they were divided into three groups, those which start in the first position, second or third position of a codon. And uh, these pentamers allow me to make Markov chain model of order four. Uh, so the difference if I would use lower Markov chain models, these probabilities will be not as crisp as uh, well uh, res uh, resolving coding and non-coding regions. So the higher more order model I use, the better resolution. However, I run in uh, uh, to some limit what I can use as uh, model order because uh, frequencies of higher uh, order oligonucleotides, six mers, seven mers, uh, octamers, they may uh, run um, into problem of uh, not very, good um, uh, counts, small counts, so even zero counts, right? So if you have uh, octamers, you have at least your training set has to be as long as four power eight, right? So it's exponentially growing. The training set is required if you're going into a larger and larger order of Markov chains. So there is some trade-off. And in this case, it was order four and in the long uh, eukaryotic genomes, we use order five, uh, but that's basically, in, uh, as you see, order four is already very good. It shows pretty good accuracy. So there is no much motivation to go into higher order and explore these limits of training. Now, uh, there are important uh, concepts of uh, how to measure accuracy. It will be sensitivity, specificity. You, uh, when you predict genes, you 
um, want to predict all the genes which are in the sequence. And your predictions shouldn't be too many because you may generate false positives and uh, your goal will be minimum false positives as well. So you want to maximize this uh, <clears throat> fraction of true genes that you want to uh, find uh, with minimizing false positives. So this um, measures uh, <clears throat> number of true genes predicted <clears throat> divided by number of true genes, sensitivity all number of true predictions divided by number of all predictions. These are very important measures and uh, two of them should be used. Otherwise, it's easy to uh, cover the, all the true genes with a huge number of false positives or to get almost no false positives, but not covering much of true genes. So these uh, extremes are not interesting. So somewhere in the middle, there is a gold uh, spot, which we want to get high sensitivity, high specificity uh, together. And uh, just to say that I uh, show how this uh, CNSP uh, changing in GeneMark algorithm if I use a different type of thresholds. And thresholds can be defined in this case as average value of the uh, posterior probability inside open reading frame. If I put thresh, uh, such threshold um, to low, I will increase sensitivity, <clears throat> but my specificity will go down. I will generate many false positives. Uh, when I um, elevate uh, the threshold, <clears throat> I get about balanced view of SNSP. So they are pretty close and really not bad. So we do predict um, genes uh, with relatively good accuracy. You will see later that we can do even better than that. Uh, this was done with our first algorithm. And this first algorithm was used to identify genes in Haemophilus influenza. It was back in 1995, and it was the first completely sequenced a genome of free living um, organism. So that was pretty a good recognition of uh, this algorithm. So that uh, was uh, just great history. Uh, I won't talk much about uh, this uh, slide, uh, although it's very interesting. The point is the patterns that we see in the genes, they may within the genes uh, have some variations and some genes which especially highly expressed genes, they used almost all optimal codons um, for each synonymous group. Um, there is codon usage pattern, which is common for majority of the genes, but some genes uh, deviate from this pattern. We call them atypical genes. And <clears throat> they have about 15% of uh, genes in genome, not more than 15%, sometimes 10, sometimes even five. It's in prokaryotic genomes, um, uh, organisms, uh, bacteria uh, are here, they tend to get some DNA from environment, they may incorporate phage DNA and uh, the codon usage in foreign DNA will be different. So some genes have uh, different GC content, different compositional pattern. They may be more difficult to predict, but we have um, tools to make it anyway but we are aware of all these variations inside the population of genes. And uh, this picture shows uh, that uh, in terms of statistics, there is a distance, in this case, relative entropy, 
represents this distance between distributions that describe composition of genes and composition of non-coding regions. So we look uh, to uh, use these differences, as you saw in the Bayesian algorithm, and you will see in later, to uh, make these differences working for discrimination of, between genes and uh, non-coding regions. So still, we have to realize that our models kind of limit us in general. So we are working to improve our models further and further and further. So the um, algorithm that is making more accurate prediction of borders between, co co between coding and non-coding regions is using uh, hidden marker models. At this time, I don't think I will be able in 10 minutes explain what are hidden Markov models, what are important algorithms in hidden Markov models, like the Turby algorithm. And uh, I just want to make you aware that we do have these very important instruments in the algorithms which um, was further a uh, step in developing this gene finding um, series. And we have pretty complex models that take into account not only um, everything that I already mentioned, but also distributions of the lengths of protein coding regions in comparison with distribution of lengths of non-coding regions. And uh, this algorithm um, finds the best parts of the genomic sequence into coding and non-coding regions given this genomic sequence and given the models that we have, particularly this three matrix um, models of protein coding regions. So the algorithm, which I will not describe in details, it's in the, in the publication in these slides, which also will be available. So we are going to um, move to uh, saying that the Gene mark in HMM in comparison with GeneMark, it um, makes um, such a parts of a sequence into coding and non-coding regions instead of sliding windows. And it is able to discriminate in the same way between direct strand coding, reverse strand coding, as well as about these atypical genes that I mentioned. Uh, which may be transferred, horizontally transferred genes, and they can be both on direct and complementary strand. So since uh, the uh, HMM is concerned about transition from one uh, hidden state to another hidden state, there will be a border, and these borders are stop cadons and start cadons, which also are parts of the uh, hidden Markov model and uh, non-coding uh, region has another um, state in the hidden uh, state diagram. Uh, more details, we would think about overlaps, we will think about ribosomal binding sites, this all type of organization of genomic DNA in prokaryotic case uh, is there in the um, prokaryotic um, gene prediction program. So this was our development from GeneMark to GeneMark HMM, and then we made a step to uh, one very important generalization. Um, as you um, may notice that when I said, I have these matrices, I have these 16 elements, that I compute from frequencies of dinucleotides, but I had to divide 
coding and non-coding regions. I had to find frequencies from already established set of protein coding regions. So someone had to predict genes, verify genes before I got to the uh, desk and starting to compute these uh, frequencies. So what I did, I described for you so-called supervised training, supervised estimation of parameters, but we can go without it. And I can say that we, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> we can, <clears throat> just a second. <clears throat> We can make a self-training algorithm <clears throat> that <clears throat> we published in 2001, called it GeneMark S. And further, <clears throat> the ideas that were in GeneMark S, they also were instrumental for developing algorithm for meta GeneMark and for new version of GeneMark S, which came to life much later. So that uh, difference between GeneMark HMM and GeneMark S is, GeneMark S is self-training. It's unsupervised training on genomic sequence. There is no need to wait until expert will come and um, tell you which sequences to take for training set. You can take the whole genome and run the gene prediction by GeneMark S or GeneMark S2 for the same way. All meta GeneMark as well. So all this Always have this uh, function. Now, then, oops, one second. Um, the way uh, to make predictions is iterative uh, in case of uh, to make training and prediction. Uh, there is some important guess how to identify initial parameters approximately this, in case of first order Markov chain, it will be um, uh, the transition probabilities in the three matrices. And then we have um, initial gene prediction. We estimate parameters from this initial set of genes um, and predicted genes are used to re-estimate parameters predict again, re-estimate again until convergence. When nothing changes, we don't see change in uh, how uh, the parse of a sequence is uh, in the sequence, uh, whole genomic sequence. Uh, there is no way we can get change in parameter estimation, right? So this is what convergence is called. And this final uh, run of predictions gives us genome annotation. So that uh, very uh, logical and uh, straightforward um, idea, which uh, basically rests on ability to make initial values of parameters quite um, good. So that's a separate topic. And um, <clears throat> we uh, made Gene Marquez, uh, this was publication in 2001, and uh, uh, now I jump to the latest Gene Marquez 2, which has a significant dif difference in terms of modeling of gene start, and uh, we um, use not only RBS, uh, but there are many other options for upstream signals. Uh, RBS can be canonical, like Chandel Gardner can be non canonical, uh, different pattern it can be without RBS at all if this leaderless transcription. We also use uh, some patterns which are upstream and downstream from start codon. And we have a number of atypical uh, models from 30% GC to 70% GC. 
so we can predict either phage uh, DNA incorporated, which is usually lower than uh, host GC content, or some transfer of DNA from bacteria with high GC content. Uh, in uh, majority of genes are predicted by a native model uh, that uh, is made also in this, uh, mainly in this iterative training. So we have predictions of overlapping genes, but not fully overlapping genes, which are extremely rare. And uh, this uh, iterative algorithm works in a little bit more complex way because initially we have to make models of protein coding regions and then we do accurate uh, evaluation of models that predict uh, gene starts. And uh, we divided genomes into several groups with respect to the type of um, translation mechanism, either Scheindel-Garner, non scheindel garner atypical RBS, uh, leaderless transcription in bacteria or in archaea. And as uh, X, uh, relatively small but important group, which has uh, enigmatic uh, translation initiation mechanism not uh, really understood yet and very weak patterns there. And I will give you briefly the patterns that we see in uh, Scheindel-Garner RBS uh, on a distance about six nucleotides from gene start in bacteria and are here a number of genomes, uh, 3,000 out of 5,000 have such um, canonical pattern. However, uh, about 500 genomes in representative genomes uh, defined by NCBI have this uh, quite interesting pattern, absolutely nothing similar to scheindel garner AGG, AGG. And uh, here is the uh, this average distance where such pattern is located. Um, actually, this is frequent in bacteria which uh, inhabit human guts. And uh, in phage of such bacteria, you will see the same pattern for RBS. So that's no wonder. And now the um, species which have sometimes literal transcription, uh, there could be um, promoters which are located in bacteria uh, on the distance about seven nucleotides from gene start. And this is uh, the gene start is the start of transcription. So there is no way to put RBS anywhere. There is no five, para, five prime uh, untranscribed region in uh, such uh, operons. So the promoter is very close to the start of a gene. But inside the operon, there will be uh, the ribosomal binding sites, uh, which are like Scheindel Garner. This is um, group C. And in uh, here, you see that there are <clears throat> uh, also quite a number of leaderless transcripts. In this case, uh, promoters are located on a larger distance from a gene start. 25 nucleotides, and again inside the operons, you will see standard uh, Schindel Garner RBS sites. And this enigmatic group X, which I mentioned, it has very uh, weak patterns and uh, still some distribution of uh, spacer lengths where they are located, but this is um, this cyanobacteria, for instance, which um, have these uh, weak um, signals. Uh, this is a distribution of um, such classes, such groups in um, different clades of bacteria. So you see that the majority are group A, but group B is uh, also quite noticeable and in uh, archaea this is group D and group C in actinobacteria 
um, etc. So these are bacteria which have a significant leaderless transcription, which uh, now we have uh, this study, which uh, is first of its kind to classify the prokaryotic world in um, depending what kind of translation mechanism is there. Uh, we have also shown that uh, gene markers 2 is uh, quite accurate. You see in the bottom, it is better in um, prediction of uh, genes, high sensitivity. It also doesn't, um, panel B is false positive predictions. So we have uh, test sets on which we uh, can show that it works uh, with a smaller number of errors in comparison with prodigal glimmer 3 and our previous uh, version gene mark S. Same thing over here. And uh, we have for gene starts also the results which shows that gene mark S2 is uh, getting more correct gene starts on a set of uh, genes with verified starts by n terminal sequencing. So this is the um, uh, result that was published 2018. Um, gene mark S2 is a part of um, NCI prokaryotic genome annotation pipeline, PGAP, and um, it's uh, since 2016, it is uh, working. It's uh, replaced gene mark S, which was there at in the beginning. And uh, by now, um, let's say September, it was 250,000 plus genomes. And now it is more than that. And um, uh, it's pretty good result uh, to have such a recognition of the algorithm in uh, annotation of prokaryotic genomes. So I will stop here because if I start talking about prokaryotes uh, further, uh, metagenomes uh, that uh, I describe how we make models for metagenomes. And I will say just one key phrase. Uh, the point is <clears throat> that <clears throat> if you look into how <clears throat> frequencies of mononucleotides, dinucleotides, and triplets, how they depend on genome GC content, you will see that they can be approximated either by straight lines, positional frequencies, or by uh, quadratic or cubic polynomials. And this observation, first of all, we'll say that uh, <clears throat> GC content is the driving force of uh, evolution of codon usage. And second, it will tell you that if you have a fragment of DNA long enough, like 400 nucleotides, you can count G and C and count GC content. Then from GC content only, you can reconstruct frequencies of hexamers and make a model, Markov chain model, non-uniform Markov chain model, which will be kind of average model of protein coding region in genomes with such and such GC content. So this is the idea which we implemented. For instance, these are um, cubic polynomials which approximate triplet frequencies. And <clears throat> we have uh, these models included into HMM, which also discriminate between bacteria and archaea. 
And this in comparison with GeneMark S2, uh, MetaGeneMark works quite accurately, uh, not as good as GeneMark S on the whole genome. If we run MetaGeneMark on the whole genome, it gives uh, about 95% accuracy with respect to GeneMark S2. And uh, MetaGeneMark was used in several high profile studies, like in MetaHeat consortium study of human gut microbiome. And uh, I will um, have to stop and not to go into eukaryotic genomes and leave it for Thomas, who prepared quite a number of slides about eukaryotic genomes. Any questions over here about prokaryotes? Everything is clear. Huh? Everything is clear. Everything is clear. I'm glad that this is, it's very nice comment. <laughs> Thank you. So I should say I am <clears throat> now presenting this part, not from Atlanta, it's in uh, North Georgia mountains. So that's just to um, make a short break from our intense conversation. And at this point, I will it's 100 miles from Atlanta, where Tomas and Alex are now. So I now leave this podium for Alexander Lomsadze. Alex, are you ready? Uh, uh, yes, Mark, question. Do we want to have a couple of minutes break and start after that? Or we are starting just immediately? I give you literally three minutes to okay. break. <laughs> okay, let's, for let's have a short break and yes. yes. So we start at, let's say 4.15. 4.15.